Uh, my name is Jessica Stewart. I'm the Executive Director of FACCR in the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. And I'd just like to warmly welcome you to our Lunch and Learn for August. Um, today we're focused on child protection and health outcomes for Aboriginal children and adolescents and presenting findings from the CRE REACH program. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which we're all coming together and meeting from. Um, where I am is the lands of the Barramudigal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. And I'd like to warmly welcome people who are joining us. Um, we've had over 700 people register, which is really fantastic. So today we will be hearing from um, our researchers from the CRE REACH program. So CRE is the Centre for Research Excellence. Uh, REACH is the Research Excellence in Aboriginal Child and Adolescent Health. And the aim of this program of research is to change the life trajectories of Aboriginal children and adolescents by tackling four, of, four big preventable causes of chronic disease, early childhood developmental delay, smoking, over and under nutrition and injury. The researchers who are leading some of the sub-studies in the program will present their findings on how to best improve adolescent and child health and the connections with child protection. And they'll also discuss implications for policy and practice. Following the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. So please use the chat um, and put your questions there and we can come back to those uh, later. So at this time, I'd like to um, introduce our presenters for today. Firstly, Professor Sandra Eads is the Associate Dean of Indigenous and Rowden White Chair in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Professor Eads is the research lead of the CRE REACH program and one of Australia's most significant Indigenous health leaders. She was Australia's first Indigenous person trained in medicine to be awarded a PhD. Welcome, Sandra. Uh, Associate Professor Melissa O'Donnell, who's Deputy Director of Research at the Australian Centre for Child Protection. She's conducted research in the area of child abuse and neglect and child protection involvement over the last 15 years. Thanks for joining us, Melissa. Um, ben Harrop is a PhD candidate and part of the iCare Western Australian study, which is analysing linked child protection data, birth records, family linkages and health data. Ben has examined the within family risk of contacts with the child protection system and is currently analysing health data for Aboriginal children born in WA and whether the health profile of those placed in out of home care is different to those who are not. Thank you, Ben. And finally, uh, Dr. Rona McNiven's research examines physical health and social and emotional wellbeing and the impact of physical activity and sport across the lifespan, particularly among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, her vision is to generate, in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers and stakeholders, high quality evidence from a series of observational and intervention studies of how physical activity can improve the health and well-being of Indigenous Australians across the life course. So thank you so much for joining us. Apologies for dropping out at the very beginning, and I will now uh, hand over to Professor Sandra Eads. Thank you. Thanks, Jess, and it's great to be here. Thank you for everyone who's attended. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Woi Wurrung uh, Kulin Nation in Nam, Melbourne, where I'm coming from. So I'm rapidly going to skim through the background to the CRE REACH program. It was five years and we're just at the end of funding and thinking about what uh, what directions to take in the next five years. So research excellence in Aboriginal child and adolescent health. Um, we started with a group of leaders from various universities in multiple states of WA, but we grew uh, a, a range of leaders and some of those leaders are here with us today to speak to you about the research they led across this program. Um, and, and it was great that it covered, was largely drawn from New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia. Um, at the time we started, several years ago, we were thinking about the youthful population for Indigenous Australians, how to produce evidence on when to in, intervene for lasting positive health outcomes, and as Jessica mentioned, a range of uh, priority areas. Um, we, we, we've 
we were and we still t continue to think about how we in universities and research institutes can produce high quality evidence um, involving, led by and involving Aboriginal researchers, growing the Aboriginal research workforce capability and nurturing future generations of Aboriginal researchers. Um, our, we had an overall vision that was um, to lead research demonstrating how best to improve Aboriginal child and adolescent health, um, providing necessary evidence for timely regional and national policy making and addressing emerging issues. And we emphasise collaboration, engagement, mentoring and traineeship and really supporting PhD and postdoctoral researchers in particular on their um, career trajectories. Um, Aboriginal child removals wasn't a major emphasis, but it did become a major emphasis during the course of the grant, alongside those other areas of research we've already touched upon. Um, and again, I can't speak in depth about the involvement and partnership with Aboriginal people and communities, but that was an essential part of our work. And amongst the people whose careers we were supporting, we were aiming to develop a comprehensive skill base covering um, all major key academic competencies and incorporating health economics and biostatistics. There were several systematic reviews completed throughout the course of the five years. And here are some of the published articles. We can provide those to Faxia um, and perhaps in the future lead another session uh, focusing on these. Um, the second theme was observational cohort studies and similar to produce new evidence. The next generation youth wellbeing study um, was wave one um, was completed during this five years and we've got funding for wave two data collection, which begins in March 2024. Some of the participants of that study are from Southwest WA um, Tamworth, Orange and the Central Coast in New South Wales. We've led work in uh, Central Australia uh, looking at zero to five year old Aboriginal children's development, a large burn injury program led by Rebecca Ivers from U UNSW. And we've got emerging research focusing on high blood pressure in Aboriginal youth and what the implications are for early screening and treatment. And you, you're probably very interested in theme three, the analysis of routinely collected data. The eye care study, the Indigenous Child Removal Study, we'll talk about today. And there were other large um, big data studies. And we're just starting a, a new project looking at developmental disability in Aboriginal children nationally and access to early intervention and NDIS support. Um, and the th fourth theme was interventions to improve health outcomes and flowing from our next generation youth mental health study, we're about to start testing a service navigation model of care for Indigenous youth with identified mental health need. And, um, these are some of the, the, the principles that underpinned our work in relation to research translation. And it's great to have the opportunity to be online speaking with you all today and trying to improve dissemination of some of our research. Um, and again, emphasising that the program focused on the development and support for future um, Tra uh, translational researchers. Thank you. So I'd like to hand over to Melissa O'Donnell. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Sandra. Um, I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging the lands that I'm on, um, which is the Bodjuk lands and the Noongar lands in, in Perth, Western Australia, um, and also to acknowledge the elders past and present and my colleagues online. 
the study that I'm going to talk to you about briefly is just um, is really in relation to the Indigenous Children in Care study that Sandra's been leading, um, really where we're trying to understand the child protection pathways for Aboriginal children, as well as mother's health and wellbeing, which impacts on the children's outcomes. Um, what we know is that Aboriginal children are overrepresented in the child protection system. And really, we wanted to understand the knowledge of what happens to the children once they have contact with the child protection system and their pathways through the system. So where they've been notified, they've had substantiations and they've entered out of home care. Um, and we also wanted to get a better understanding of when they were entering care and their placement types as well. Um, as you can see here, 50% um, of the children um, were notified before the age of five years and 18% were identified as infants. Um, and almost 50% of the children who had a substantiation ended up in the out-of-home care system. So you can see here, the contact really starts at quite a young age. So we're showing you here the age at first notification and their highest level of child protection involvement up until the age of 10. So you can see that the um, the infancy period is a really is a period at which children are coming into the system at quite a quite a high rate, and this is probably a point of early intervention and support for families to prevent children from entering the out of home care system. And what we know is that if a child enters care at an early age, they usually spend a longer amount of time in care. Um, and so what we've also done is to look at what happened at the age of 10 years. So what happened at that follow up period? What we did find was that the majority of children um, remained in care. So 62% of the children who entered care before the age of 10 remained in care at the age of um, at the age of 10 and likely they were on on until 18 orders. Well, we also found that 19% of the children were reunified with family. Um, and at the end of the first, there was 19% that also were left care for other reasons. So that included um, guardianship orders, et cetera. Um, what we did find that was that at the first period of care, there were a number of children, about 25% of children that were reunified with family. But unfortunately, um, there was a high number of children that actually were re, um, re-notified to the system and then re-entered care. So we're, we're not seeing huge reunification rates with families, which is a really, I guess, an opportunity in which we can do more work to support children to remain at home with their families. We're also looking at the placement types that the children were exposed to. Um, the children were often, particularly at a younger age, placed in foster care, which is the blue line. And you'll see, particularly during infancy um, and those early periods, um, many of them are placed in foster care at first placements. Um, and But what we did find as well, um, in terms of the predominant placement type, many of them ended up in kinship placements, which is the, the orange bar. So what we're seeing is that children often enter care through a foster care placement and then maybe reunified with kinship carers so that they remain in the family. And I guess so this shows that there's an opportunity for us, you know, for child protection um, to work more closely with families to identify kinship as a first point of placement for families um, so that the children can remain in the extended family network before being placed in foster care. We're also really keen to investigate the mother's health and wellbeing and how that impacted on the children's involvement with child protection. Um, and we know that in terms of the intergenerational health predictors of children entering care, this is a really important area. And it is also an area of opportunity in terms of closing the gap for the, num the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. And it's also part of the safe and support of the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children to look at how we can support the reduction of Aboriginal children in care. So really, we want to describe the health and wellbeing of mothers prior to their children entering the out-of-home care system, as well as the health and mental health conditions that they may experience. So we looked at this at three time points during the perinatal period, um, five years prior to removal and one year prior to removal. What we did find was that there was for the care group who had who were placed in out-of-home care, there was a high level of involvement with the health system. 
So this is this is um, the results for five years prior to removal, but there were similar um, similar rates in terms of the perinatal period as well as the one year prior to removal, and we compared them to children who might have contact with the out of home care um, child protection system but didn't go into out of home care as well as the no contact group who haven't had any child protection involvement. So as you can see, the highest numbers of um, health-related contacts were in regards to alcohol and drug, which 52% of the mothers experienced, injuries and poisonings, um, with, with a higher level of assault-related hospital admissions, mental health diagnoses at 52%, and potentially preventable hospitalisations. So we can see these um, mums and their families are coming into contact with the health system at quite a high rate. So there is a, amount of, a large opportunity for in terms of intervention and support for these mothers. What we did find was that there was also co-occurring health-related conditions. So you can see here that um, while most of those mothers had at least one um, one co-occurring one condition, there was a large proportion with co-occurring conditions that 53% had two or more co-occurring conditions. And this was in comparison to the contact group that only had 23% and the no contact group at 7.5%. So these families are actually having a higher level of contact across a, across a number of conditions. And what we did find was that if you look at the five years prior to the child be being removed, the most prevalent comorbidity was actually mental health and alcohol and drug related hospitalisations. Um, and the other one was mental health, alcohol and drug and assault. So um, what we could really determine was the health system have an important role to play in terms of the families that are that are being in contact with child protection. They're seen at a high rate in the hospital and mental health systems prior to their children being removed and also during that perinatal period, which is a really good opportunity for support for families. We're really, this was the first study to really quantify that level of multiple and complex needs that the mothers are experiencing. And it also shows that there are, that, that highlights the importance of really delivering the services and support that recognises the multiple needs within the, these families. I think the opportunities to support these mothers are that they do have high contact with systems. The challenges in the, in their families is the complexity of the level of involvement and the need for culturally secure services to meet those needs. And I think what we can can say is that ACOs really have a have a key role to play in terms of connecting with Aboriginal mothers and families, as well as connecting them with other services and supports to prevent the removal of children. Um, so this is just a, I guess, just an overview of some of the work that we're doing to look at how we can reduce the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children um, in the child protection system. And we've got a lot more work to do in this area, as well as translation work that can be achieved. And we'd just like to acknowledge all of the agencies that have been involved. Um, and I'd like to pass on to Ben, who's going to follow up with, with the other research. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Mel. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start out acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wadawurrung people uh, in Ballarat in Victoria. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. So I'm just going to go through some work that I've been doing as part of my PhD in collaboration with um, Melissa and Sandra um, and some of the people on the I Care WA project. Um, when the slides get passed around, you'll be able to, I mean, you can use a QR code to get the full paper, but this is going to be a little summary overview and some next steps as well. So the aims of this study were to have a look at some more contemporary um, child protection data in uh, for Aboriginal children born in Western Australia um, and to really look at how the contacts with child protective services were clustered within family units because um, this was something that came up in the community advisory groups was that uh, a, a few times it was mentioned that once uh, families had contact with child protective services and in particular once they'd had a child removed that it felt like they were always going to have any more children that they might have in the future also taken away and it felt like quite it felt quite deterministic and like there wasn't any option to change and you know, prevent that from happening so yeah we're using for this particular study uh, linked administrative data for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children born in Western Australia between 2000 and 2013 um, and we've got child protection contacts um, 
and placement through to placements in out-of-home care um, for 2000 to the 2015 period. Uh, and then we also have some uh, additional data linking to um, families, so biological mother and full and maternal half siblings. So um, the top three data sets, the data sets that we used for this study, um, birth, deaths and marriages, midwife notification system and the yeah, child protection data set. Uh, the remainder of them I haven't used in this study, but I am currently working on them to explore, uh, as Jess mentioned, some of the health conditions and whether they vary depending on whether children have whether the prevalence of them varies and depending on whether kids are in contact with child protective services or not. So uh, just as a broad overview, um, this is just a summary of all of the contacts that the cohort, uh, which is around the 33,709 children had with child protective services. And you can see from the notification stage all the way through to placements and end up home care that the majority of children never had any contact and that's represented by the no contact line at the top there. Um, but when children did have contacts with child protective services, uh, most of the time, besides for substantiations, um, they tended to have at least uh, two, if not more, contacts um, with, with child protective services. Um, with this table, this is just presenting a summary of all contacts. There's not necessarily a correspondence here between each of the different stages, you know, where a child could have had one notification, multiple investigations and one placement or multiple notifications, and then nothing else for the remainder of the, the system there. Um, then what I'm presenting here is the cumulative incidence of contacts with child protective services, which is just showing um, what proportion of children within our cohort, those 33,709 children, have had a contact with child protective services by what age, um, and we've got follow up here up to the age of 16. Now, because we've got children from 2000 to 2013, um, we've got varying degrees of follow up time. Um, but you can see here, um, there's a fairly similar trend between the uh, notifications uh, and the investigations. They sit fairly close to each other. Um, there's about a 5% difference in the proportion of children that uh, receive a notification versus those that receive an investigation. But then I guess there's a big gap there between uh, the number of investigations that have occurred and the correspondingly the number of substantiated cases of maltreatment or neglect um, that have been uh, found. And then the that's the blue line and then the purple line being the proportion of children who've had a placement in out of home care. So not all um, substantiated cases of maltreatment result in a placement in out of home care. It's not necessarily. There's obviously the option of provision for social support and family services to prevent that placement in out of home care happening. Um, but I think the next few slides are sort of the more, um, I guess, interesting or detailed um, yeah, parts of this research. So th this is just summarising um, for the analysis that we've done looking at the families. Um, we are only considering family units where there's more than one child. So in the analysis that I'll present in a second, just having a look at the um, contacts within sibling groups, but only considering sibling groups of size two or more. Um, what this graph here is presenting is the um, proportion, yeah, the cumulative incidence of contacts or the proportion of the cohort who have had a contact with child protective services for each stage, the top left window being notifications, top right investigations, bottom left substantiations and bottom right placements. And what we're doing here is just trying to understand how contacts with child protective services are changing over time. Um, so the blue lines are the children that were born earliest in our follow up time, um, those born 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, green lines sort of in the middle there, and then the red and orange lines are the children that were born more recently. And there's a pretty clear trend across all of the stages is that for children that were born more recently, I, those born in 2010, 2011 or 2012, 2013, uh, they're having contacts with child protective services uh, at much earlier ages. And that's indicated by the sort of steepening lines at age zero or a birth. You can see, um, and if you have a look at the slides later, you can zoom in, or if you have a look at the paper, you can zoom in on the graph to get a bit more detail. Um, but basically for, for the children that were born more recently, the, there's the lines quite vertical um, at birth, which is indicating contacts uh, and indeed placements and out of home care at birth. Um, and for, yeah, so 
in terms of specific numbers, was we were having a look at um, the proportion of children with a placement in out-of-home care um, by age one. And for the children born in the 2000 to 2001 group, this was about 2.3% of them. But for those in the uh, 2012 to 13 group, this is about 4.5%. So it's almost doubled in that 12-year um, period. So the next thing that uh, I'm presenting here is just when children within sibling groups, so remember I before was saying this is just for um, families that have got at least two children um, in the family unit. So this is presenting when children are having a contact with child protective services relative to the earliest contact within their sibling group. So if you imagine um, there's a record for a child who has um, uh, the first contact among any of, any of their siblings, are the other siblings in their sibling group having a contact on the same date or at a later date or none at all? And that's what these three columns here are presenting. And the main thing to note is that for every stage, if there's a contact for one sibling, it's most likely that other siblings within that same um, sibling group will also have a contact um, on the same date. And that's that first column there, the same as sibling group's first contact, which means in for placements, for example, um, when there are multiple children in a family group, 64% of the time, multiple siblings are going to be being placed in out-of-home care uh, at the same time. Um, it's not always the case. You can see on the right-hand side that 27% in our follow-up period didn't have a contact or a placement in out-of-home care. Um, so not necessarily deterministic, but, but quite probable that that's going to happen. Uh, and then finally, what we've got with this slide is just um, splitting uh, our cohort into whether they were born before or after the first contact with child protective services for each stage within their sibling group. So imagine there's um, children that are placed in out-of-home care and then the, their mum has another child. That child who's then born after that first placement happened is represented by the blue line here. Um, and you can see it's quite considerably different um, between the two groups here. Um, the green line is fairly straight and fairly steady, um, I guess indicating that children who are the first or they're alive before the first contact within their family group um, happens, the risk is fairly um, consistent. But for children who are born to mums who have already got children in love home care, the risk is much higher of having a contact at younger ages. And you can see um, with the blue line in the bottom right hand panel, which is the placements in out of home care, that you're looking at around 20% of children of these children being placed out of home care within the first couple of months of being born. And I think that really tells to the story that we were hearing in the um, in the community reference groups. So you can find some more details about that in the paper, but some, some next steps that I'm working on now is yeah, having a look at the health profiles of children um, comparing those who are never in out of home care to those that are in care, because one of the things that we heard about was how um, carers quite often aren't aware of some of the health needs that children that come into their care have. Uh, and yeah, ho we're hopefully trying to characterize some of the more common health conditions that might be useful for service providers and carers of children who are in out of home care to maybe be aware of or think about. Um, and yeah, we're using um, hospitalization data and Finally, as well, going to have a look at the um, distance between where children's residential address is recorded and um, where the child protection offices are located for the different regions in WA, um, just to see whether that is related to the probability of coming into contact with child protective services as well. Um, and that's all of my findings, I guess. I, I think I would just echo what Melissa was saying as well about the need for um, culturally safe services and early intervention because in, in WA, they do have a policy around, um, it's called pre-birth planning. So when the department is aware of a mother who's pregnant, who's previously had children in out-of-home care, they are, you know, they, they provide services to help support the mother, mother and prevent, um, you know, address any concerns that might result in them removing that child shortly after it's born. However, that, that's only a 20 week period, potentially at most, um, and 20 weeks, I don't think is quite long enough to address some of the quite um, you know, systemic issues that families are facing. Um, so I think, yeah, early intervention is a key aspect of um, yeah, addressing this uh, of representation as well. 
But yeah, so that's that's all for me. Um, I just wanted to hand over to Rona now. Thanks, Rona. Oh, can't hear you, Rona. You might be on mute. Thanks, Ben. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the land that um, I'm speaking on today, and it's the Bidigal and Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, I'm going to talk about something uh, a, a bit broader and more holistic, um, and that relates to the Next Generation Youth health and well-being study that Sandra mentioned in the introduction and specifically I'm going to talk about physical activity and sport participation um, and related protective and risk factors um, that can be can, can be considered as diversionary strategies with relevance um, to out of home care and child protection, um, but are relevant uh, for all Aboriginal children and really all children. And um, so uh, a bit of background. Um, we, we know from data um, from government at the national level um, that Aboriginal children have very high levels of physical activity, higher than non-Aboriginal children. Uh, however, this uh, declines at some point during adolescence and um, adults, Aboriginal adults, uh, tend to have lower physical activity than non-Indigenous adults. Um, and there's a whole host of complex interrelated reasons or, or barriers for this. Um, physical activity in sport uh, is popular um, among Aboriginal children and families and communities, and it has been identified, identified as a priority for research and practice by adolescents. Um, we know that um, physical activity offers an opportunity to connect to culture, um, whether it's um, being active on country and um, linking with cultural knowledge and um, the passing down of knowledge from elders to the next generation through being on country. And uh, we know that it's associated with better well-being for Aboriginal people. This is social and emotional well-being, a holistic concept. Uh, we know that uh, males tend to have higher participation levels than females um, across all ages. And we also know that um, time spent on screens is associated with lower physical activity uh, in time use studies. Um, and that family and group participation uh, is an enabler to physical activity participation. And so the next generation study and um, the full pro protocol uh, was published um, uh, around four years ago now. Um, so briefly, uh, it's an Aboriginal led study with Sandra Eads as the chief investigator and uh, many other Aboriginal investigators and emerging researchers. Uh, it took place in um, Western Australia, Central Australia and um, New South Wales, um, the first uh, baseline cohort up until March 2020 um, and the follow up cohort planning is currently underway. Um, it's holistic in looking um, at um, various domains of um, health and well-being uh, as well uh, through a, a survey, as well as um, clinical assessment using a point of care blood testing. Um, the first wave had over 1200 survey completions. Um, well, I'm going to focus on the methods for a particular piece of analysis um, that was focused on sport and physical activity um, that um, looked at um, the outcome variable from a question uh, from the Western Australia Aboriginal Child Health Survey that asked uh, the children and adolescents outside of school hours in the past week, how, on how many days did you exercise or play sport or games that made you sweat and 
breathe hard. So this is focusing on out of school physical activity. So in leisure time or free time. Um, the other variables of interest um, were recreational screen time, weekday and weekend. Um, uh, the influences of peers um, in relation to smoking and alcohol, as well as adolescents own behaviours, uh, various health and well-being uh, variables, um, looking at strengths and difficulties um, and throughout this, the analysis, taking a strengths based approach, looking at um, the positive side of an outcome and uh, looking at um, the presence of activities for young people to do in a community, specifically team and individual sport, as well as church and religious activities um, and arts based activities. And um, importantly, also looked at Aboriginal culture and language. For this specific analysis, um, we undertook logistic regression models focusing on um, the protective behaviour and the strengths based approach of at least three days a week of physical activity. Uh, we, we saw a trend where the younger adolescents had higher physical activity levels. This is the proportion uh, reaching that at least three days a week um, and a pretty linear decline through to, to uh, the ages in the early 20s. Uh, higher physical activity after adjusting for all of the other variables in the model was um, associated with, uh, was, was higher among um, males of the boys in the sample, uh, higher among those with lower recreational weekday screen time, uh, higher among adolescents with non-smoking friends and with fewer friends who drink alcohol. When we looked um, at social and emotional well-being and um, community-based activities, um, we found higher physical activity associated with better overall health, um, with the associated with perception among young people that there were activities to do in their community, uh, associated with higher resilience, which came from the strengths part of the strengths and difficulties questionnaire measure. And interestingly, was um, associated not only with team and individual sport, which we might expect, but higher physical activity was also associated with church and religious activities. Um, so um, in conclusion, um, we found a range of uh, health and well-being associations with physical activity um, that were specific to uh, other behaviours of screen time and peer smoking and alcohol levels associated with better uh, self-rated health and higher well-being and engagement in community activities, uh, whether they were sport based um, or um, non-physically active or cultural activities. Um, so some implications um, that um, we need to uh, have a particular focus on Aboriginal females and the older adolescents and support to engage in physical activity. Um, targeting screen time and other health behaviours and peer behaviours simultaneously um, may give best um, bang for our buck in physical activity promotion. Um, culture needs to be at the core um, of any activities for it to be um, relevant and feasible for Aboriginal adolescents. And um, all of these implications are for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adolescents um, overall. Um, but we acknowledge that those in out of home care um, and within the child protection system um, may require additional strategies and focus um, to facilitate um, engagement and ongoing participation. Thank you, and I'm going to pass over to Jessica now. Thank you, Rona, and uh, thank you all so much for those terrific presentations. Uh, we have had a number of questions in the chat. Some of them have been answered. Um, 
but I might just come back to a few of them and we will provide some links to um, to various uh, pieces of work or reforms that you might be interested in. So one of the questions which Melissa, you did put an answer to, but do we know the outcome differences for Aboriginal children in foster care compared to kinship care? Did you want to quickly address yeah, that Yeah, just, just to say that there is some evidence that Aboriginal children in kinship care placements have better mental health outcomes. And we also found that for the infants that we'd study in the Pathways of Care Longitudinal Study, and Sandra Eads and I are doing some more research in regards to the mental health outcomes of children in care in the Pockle study. So, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to be looking at whether kinship placements can provide um, that, you know, that strength and mental health outcomes. So, yeah, it's definitely a good question. Thank you. Um, there's also some questions around uh, the availability of alcohol in communities. And I guess this also comes back to the discussion around how we can better support um, women and families through the health system, particularly who might be at risk of their children being removed. Um, does, does anyone want to comment on those questions about, I guess, what we can do to better support women and families to prevent child removal? Yes, Sandra might be able to talk to some of this as well, but um, just to I just put in the chat that Fitzroy Crossing is an example where the community um, made the decision, the Aboriginal community made the decision to put in alcohol restrictions, um, as well as the development of support services for families. So I think where there's a really community-driven approach, a place-based yeah. community-driven approach that stems from the community and looks at what support services are needed, um, as well as the you know the decisions they make about alcohol restrictions. I think where that's community decided and self-determination, I think that's that's a really good approach. Sandy, do you want to comment on that as well? Yes, thanks, Melissa. Um, Alice Springs is probably one of the most recent examples of where. Uh, where stricter alcohol um, restrictions exist for the whole community. There's lower presentations to ED with trauma, assaults of mothers and so on. So in a discrete town or a discrete community, it's easy it's easier for a community to make those decisions, but for Aboriginal women living in Western Sydney or Eastern suburbs of Perth, it's a harder um it, it's not it's not a simple remedy. Um, my, my thinking, seeing the data from Melissa's presentation, took the other direction, which was how do we support those mothers and what what are the interventions we we can put in place to better support those mothers with multiple comorbidities, mental health problems, drug drug and alcohol problems? Does the system have a strong enough support? a uh, strong enough target to supporting those women so we don't have the expense and the emotional toll and burden of um, of, of up to decade, a decade or more of children in the out-of-home care system. Thanks. Thanks, Sandra and Melissa. And have you had discussions with your research findings about what some of those supports might look like, like where we should be investing more? Yeah, I think people also commented about the early intervention and family support yeah. strategies that are needed. And I think I think governments are hearing that, that that first 1,000 and 2,000 days is a really important opportunity to support families and improve outcomes for kids. So I think I think those are two of the areas. I think the um, strengthening of Aboriginal community controlled organisations in communities is really important as well um, to make sure that communities have the resources and culturally um, appropriate services that can support families as well. So I think there is a number of strategies that could you know that could be strengthened. Um, and then I think I think governments. You know, while it has been slow to to take on board, I think I think there is notice by governments now that there is a need for investment in early intervention and family support. Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah, I think just sorry, go ahead, ben. Well, sorry. Um, there's been a few different trials of Aboriginal family-led decision making um, in different states, uh, different jurisdictions around the country, and there's one currently happening. In Western Australia, um, and just from reading the reviews that um, people have published on those programs, basically where there's uh, a bigger, I guess, a bigger voice or more attention given to the voices of Aboriginal people in the decision-making process around decisions that affect their children, um, 
it, it can be quite effective in improving, uh, I guess, the outcomes for those children. And I see um, in the chat Nelly's talking about uh, self-determination and control of resources. And yeah, incorporating the, um, I guess, traditional perspectives in how to address issues is really important. But yeah, just going back to the reviews of those, um, the decision making pilots is that it seems to be largely the success seems to be dependent on how cooperative the um, child protective services um, staff are in, I guess, relinquishing some of the control over the decision making process to um, Aboriginal voices. Yeah. Thank you. There's a there's two questions here and something I'm interested in as well that we talk about a lot. So it's around measurement tools um, and thoughts on child protection out of home care and other services using culturally normed screening tools such as the ASQ track to identify developmental delays early to support access to early intervention services. Um, Jess, Anita De Prano is involved in this program and maybe we can get her along to speak at a a future meeting about ages and stages questionnaire because there's several iterations of that um, that she's been testing and validating in health services around the country. She does need more collaborators. So okay. if if there are other sites in New South Wales or other states where where um, early childhood health or learning centres are interested in collaborating, it would be good to know so that Anita can continue that work. It was quite disrupted during COVID as well. Yeah. So, um, but that program's ongoing. That would be great. We, it would be good to get her to present and we should um, we should talk about collaboration. That would be great. Um, so there is, sorry, there's another question around, has epigenetics been considered in the health needs of children and adolescents? Well, I was a big fan of the idea that there could be some intergenerational impacts of health exposures. In theory, it sounded good. Um, Alison Gibbard, who was also um, a biostatistician associated with this study, we could present this study at a future meeting as well. We had data for grandmothers, mothers and newborn babies, and we looked at whether um, take it whether we could model and show what pr proportion of the causal pathway for low birth weight as an outcome was unexplained and which in the current generation and which could be explained by, um, you know, a cross-generation epigenetic exposure. And we found only 3% of the risk for a low birth weight birth wasn't explained by factors acting in a single generation. So... You know, there was no no room in our models for something as important as low birth weight to be to have a an epigenetic explanation. So I thought my 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 view now is if epigenetics doesn't seem to have a role in something as important as low birth weight, then we should be skeptical about its influence on other outcomes. And I think being optimistic, um, you know, the epigenetic story is pessimistic. It means mm. we can't change things in our lifetime. Um, they're they're kind of predetermined across several lifetimes. So I think from from that paper of ours that we could we, we could get Alison to speak about it in another meeting. I'm I'm not a big fan of epigenetics, um, and I try to focus on what's happening in our current lifetimes and the current generation where actions of individuals, families, communities, government can actually have an impact. That's that's my view great. now. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Well, that's great and a positive research finding. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question here around disability, so is disability being considered as well as health issues for parents and children? 
Yeah, my previous research has looked at disability and disability status definitely um, plays a role in terms of families coming to the attention of child protection and removal into care. Um, and the eye care study, including Ben's work, is is investigating this further with Aboriginal children um, who are brought into care. So I think we'll, we'll definitely have more to say on this um, and more evidence to be able to bring to bear. Um, but yeah, and also mother's intellectual disability we've studied previously, and that definitely has an impact as well. Um, um, so, yeah, that, it's a, it's an important factor and the NDIS and the support services available are really important in terms of providing support to those families who need it. Thank you. There's another question around um, the focus on mothers only and not fathers as well. I would like to comment on that. Yeah, I, I um, answered that in the chat just for later on, but it's basically just because the way that we needed to identify family units, we could have identified that um, by linking children in who are share, who have share the same mother and same father, um, but we decided to opt with just the mothers as the, um, I guess, the person who we connect all siblings to, because all children have a mother on their birth record, but it wasn't the case for fathers, so because there wasn't that complete data for fathers, we, we opted just um, to stick with mothers. Um, but the other thing um, I guess I want to flag there as well is that uh, we are limited by the data that is collected, um, not even just because fathers were missing, missing but if we're considering a uh, family and kin um, in you know Aboriginal communities, just recording biological family doesn't necessarily um, characterise the cultural um, family and connections that the you know there might be more people who are in that family unit caring for that child outside of just the biological parents um i guess that's one of the other limitations of using um yeah biological data and Thank just you. to add okay, add to just to add to ben's point we 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 do we are very interested in the impact of fathers with data linkage, it's much easier to um, determine who the mothers are. And um, there's the problem with birth registrations being lower and delayed for Aboriginal children in large data linkage um, systems. So there's a time delay in being able to identify and link fathers as well. Um, in our next generation youth study, we are looking at outcomes for males. And we know that the health of young men is important and it's significant for their own health, but their health of their partners and um, their offspring in the future. So we're we're looking for innovative ways to keep men and young men and fathers visible in research that's essentially about Aboriginal families and communities. Thank you. Um, Sandy, I had a question too around um, more broadly the, the work of the CRE and supporting um, Aboriginal-led research. Do you have advice for, for government and um, our NGO partners about how we can best support policy and practice relevant research? Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, the partnerships are the, the hardest thing to have isn't it the the connections i know you fairly well because we've worked in a previous life in a previous job and made the connection so um i think we've got to be creative i've seen on the chat someone wanting to know if we can keep these sorts of symposiums um going and share a mechanism like this for researchers to speak directly to a community or a policy audience and and share with you uh, our research findings it'll help us understand um, the policy implications and make it more useful for government we're contemplating a ways to continue CRE reach with all of our existing resources but also future funding applications to continue to fund more researchers to do research and focus on questions that are important to government. So um, through Faxia and yourself and others, Jess, we may be able to come back to government partners and, and ask them to collaborate in future initiatives. That'd be great, thank you. Um, any final comments in the last minute? Um, 
Rona, perhaps from you, any reflections on, uh, particularly from, I guess, our child protection area? How can we best support young people around engaging in um, more positive things like physical activity? Um, I th something I think can can make a difference, and I don't have a lot of uh, data or information on this, but it's ensuring that systems are supportive of children and adolescents participating in community activities. Um, and th this could relate to permission to take part um, in activities in the community um, that um, uh, may have different implications for children in out of home care, foster care. Um, and a a another big consideration is um, the, the cost of activities, um, mm. you know, be they physical activities or um, arts based, um, music based, they're, they're often um, you know, privately for profit um, and, you know, maybe cater to time poor families. Um, but we know that you know, the costs of participating in sport are high and that can be a real barrier. Um, so uh, investment in you know, real grassroots community activities with very low or no costs um, can remove that barrier. Um, that could be through initiatives like um, PCYC, YMCA, um, or it could be through providing um, activities uh, where all costs are considered. And this can include transport, um, as well as um, wraparound services like providing children um, with after school um, food and snacks or a breakfast club. Um, and you know, we, we know that that facilitates engagement and can be a way to bring families uh, in as well. So th those would be my closing comments. Thank you, Rona. Um, ben, any closing comments? Um, no, I was just busy talking to someone in the chat. Um, I, I think <laughs> that's okay. The conversation about having earlier intervention and more culturally sensitive and safe um, processes and procedures earlier in the pipeline um, is, I think, going to be really important. Thank you, and Melissa. No, I just it's a good opportunity to for us to really, you know, get out there in terms of the messaging around, yeah, the early intervention of family support strategies and how we can best intervene and support families prior to children being removed. Um, so yeah, thank you for that opportunity, Jess. Thank you. And Sandra, any closing comments? Um, we did focus a lot on child protection, but I think Rona's work and other work from our next generation youth. Um, cohort study is highlighting earlier uh, onset of risk factors for chronic mm. disease, um, physical inactivity, overweight obesity, um, high blood pressure. We're teasing out how significant that is, but people should really take seriously um, the need not for just great access to primary health care, but great access to preventive health care. Um, safe, uh, high quality, affordable food and opportunities to be active um, wherever they are and, and to facilitate policy that enables that. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for presenting today. We would uh, love to have you and your research colleagues back for another one of these. Um, so for everyone that did register, we'll send you a link to the to the uh, recorded webinar and also some links that will answer a lot of the questions in the chat. Um, and we'd also like to invite you to our next one, uh, our September Lunch and Learn. And the title for that one is Pre uh, Preventing and Responding to Self-Harm and Suicidal Ideation, the Latest Research and Best Practice for Children and Young People in Out-of-Home Care. Um, but for now, thank you so much. You can see all the claps coming up and, and hearts for you. So really fantastic presentations and um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.